Good morning, church. Hey, if you have your Bibles, you're in Genesis chapter 25 this morning. Genesis chapter 25, verses 1 through 18. This is uh, the last sermon we'll do in Genesis for a while. It will also be the last sermon you'll have from me for a couple weeks. And then I'm going to be taking a break to, to hold my baby. But, uh, but bear with me through one more long sermon. Genesis chapter 25, verses 1 through 18. It says, Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah. She bore him Zimron, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan fathered she, uh, Sheba and Dadan. The sons of Dadan were Ashurim, Letushim, and Laomim. The sons of Midian were Ephah, Ether, Hanak, Abida, and El. Aldea. All these were the children of Keturah. Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac, but to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts. And while he was still living, he sent them away from his son Isaac eastward to the east country. These are the days of the years of Abraham's life, 175 years. Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. Isaac and Ishmael, his sons, buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar, the Hittite, east of Mamre, the field that Abraham purchased from the Hittites. There Abraham was buried with Sarah, his wife. After the death of Abraham, God blessed Isaac, his son, and Isaac settled at Be'er Lahai Roy. These are the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's servant, bore to Abraham. These are the names of the sons of Ishmael, named in the order of their birth. Nebioth, the firstborn of Ishmael, and Kadar, Ab- Adbiel, Midsam, Mishma, Duma, Masa, Hadad, Tema, Jetor, Naphish, and Kedema. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names by their villages and by their encampments, twelve princes according to their tribes. These are the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years. He breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. They settled from Havilah to Shur, which is opposite Egypt in the direction of Assyria. He settled over against all his kinsmen. Ooh, Kate, glad to be done with that reading. Hey, let's open up the word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray that as we look at your word this morning, that um, you would just open our eyes and our hearts that we might behold wonderful things from your word. And I pray that, Father, you would use even a passage like this to teach us uh, about just who you are, uh, your nature, your will for our life, that um, this passage would move us into uh, just a stronger faith and trust in you, a greater desire to be obedient to your will, your commands. I just pray, Father, that you would help me to uh, not say anything, Lord, that would be um, heretical or that would contradict your written word, uh, but I pray that you would give us grace in this way. Father, we're reminded that apart from Jesus, we can do nothing at all. So, Lord, we just ask for your help. We ask for your guidance, and we pray this all in the name of Christ. Amen. The passage we're looking at today, it, uh, it reads kind of like an obituary, right? Abraham lived this many years, had these sons, he died, looked like a good life, kind of the end of the story. 
Um, it's a bit of an odd passage. It's another genealogy. And my notes are organized a bit differently today. What I want to do is consider just three um, interpretive notes about this passage today and then move on to three considerations from this passage today. So three notes about the passage, three notes or three considerations uh, stemming from this passage. I'm careful to use the word considerations because uh, they're just that, but I will offer them for consideration. So the notes. Number one, first of all, the passage here is a genealogical record, and as we've seen before and will continue to see, genealogies typically function like chapter breaks throughout the book of Genesis. The narrator has placed this genealogy here to close the door on both Abraham and Ishmael. He's done that to move our attention fully onto Isaac and Rebekah and the descendants to follow. It's kind of end of the story. That leads to a second point, which is the fact that Abraham's death isn't necessarily in historical or chronological order here. Genesis 25, basically what I'm saying is that from a chronological perspective, it's out of order. It should come later in the story, but the author of Genesis instead seems to be organizing the details topically. Why do I think that? Well, we know from the numbers given that Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born, and uh, 160 years old when his grandkids, uh, Jacob and Esau, were born, which means that he would still be alive for 15 years after Jacob and Esau are born. It's just that we have the death here rather than after that. Why does this matter? Here's why it matters. It just leaves open the question as to when Abraham took this additional wife named Keturah in verse 1. Since Sarah has already died, it's easy to assume that this marriage took place after all of that, and there's a good chance it did, that he got married again uh, later on in life when he was a widower. But we just can't be sure, and scholars are divided on this. It's possible that Abraham had this additional wife long before, and we just never heard about her. On the one hand, she's called a wife, but we see that she's also called a concubine, which means that she is, or she was, essentially a wife of lesser status. Scripture never encourages the use of concubines, but this was a very common practice in the ancient world, and it was often used as a strategic way of having more children, more descendants, more offspring. Either way, we're left with the conclusion that Abraham, before he died, had many sons, and this gets to the last point about the passage. You ever heard that song? Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. Sorry, it's fresh in my mind because I think we've been listening to this song every day for the last month because Judah and Yvonne insist on listening to that very song. Third point about this passage, and probably most importantly, the details in here confirm the word of God that's already been given to Abraham. So uh, consider this. Genesis chapter 17, verse 6, God said to Abraham, I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. Well, we see in this passage that Abraham did indeed become fruitful, and nations came from him. Uh, Genesis chapter 15, verse 15, as for you, God says to Abraham, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. What does this chapter show us? That Abraham died and was buried at a good old age, full of years. Genesis chapter 17, verse 20, Ishmael would become the father of 12 princes. This is what God told Abraham back in 17. What do we see in Genesis chapter 25? You notice how Ishmael has, uh, there's descendants listed from Ishmael. Guess how many there are? Twelve. Genesis chapter 16, verse 12, God said that Ishmael would dwell over and against his brothers. And what do we see in this chapter? Verse 18, all the tribes coming from Ishmael did just that. They dwelt over against their brothers. Genesis 25 then, in its own way, in a very colorful way, is basically showing us God's word can be trusted. Everything that God says, every promise he makes, will come to pass 
you can be as sure of it as you can be of the sun coming up in the morning. His word never fails. And it's like this passage just screams that. Those are the three interpretive notes I wanted to uh, consider this morning. Now I want to just um, offer three considerations from the passage this morning. Uh, there's three paragraphs, and so there's three things that I want to touch on. First of all, the life of Abraham. Just very quickly, the life of Abraham. Verse 5, it says that Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac. On the surface, it sounds like a father who played favorites with his kids. I don't think that's at all the case. God had promised all along that Isaac would be the heir It would be through Isaac's line that all the promises of God would carry forward. And ultimately, it would be through Isaac that God would bless the entire world. Remember that blessing back in Genesis chapter 12. So when Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac, it surely wasn't because he was playing favorites, but because he wanted to be all in on the plan of God. His whole life was just dedicated to, to God's purposes for the world. This is undoubtedly the most notable thing about Abraham and why he is rightly considered the father of the faith. He left everything behind to follow God and his life was devoted to the purposes of God. He forfeited all kinds of worldly pleasures and treasures out of a desire to live for God and yet there's no indication anywhere that he ever regretted it that he died in regret or sorrow, or that he died unsatisfied. Jesus called his disciples in Matthew 6 to seek first the kingdom of God and all else will be given to you. This is what Abraham did. Again, Jesus said, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And again, Abraham is somebody who modeled this teaching of Jesus. His life was a picture of what that looked like. And if anything, as you consider the life of Abraham, I just think it invites personal reflection. What does it look like in your life to be all in for God? Are there certain things holding you back? Perhaps sins that you continue to live in? Or maybe things in life that you are pursuing and putting all your energy into things that just really, in the end, aren't worth it. A friend of mine once said, I love this quote, we are all fools for something. Why not then just be a fool for Christ? If we're going to be all in for something, why not be all in for God? Next, consider the death of Abraham. It says he died at a good old age. He died. His sons were buried. Or he died and his sons buried him at the cave of Machpelah. And there in that cave, he's laid to rest with his wife, Sarah. There is a very strange idiom here, though, that I want you to consider or to look at. Verse 8. It says that Abraham died and he was gathered to his people. And we see that the same phrase is used of Ishmael, too. And I believe after this, it's going to be used three more times in the Old Testament for Jacob, for Joseph, and for Moses. On the surface, it sounds like a nice way of saying that his family gathered around his graveside, right? He's gathered to his people in his death. I don't think, though, that that's the case. I think something far more mystifying is being communicated here. Abraham being gathered to his people surely isn't a casual way of saying that Abraham died because the text, if you notice, it already said that Abraham died. And it can't be a way of describing his burial, the fact that he was gathered to his people. It can't be talking about his burial because his burial is then described immediately after this. Furthermore, Abraham wasn't buried with his ancestors. Uh, His ancestors lived some 500 miles away. He was buried in a cave where nobody else except his wife was buried. 
So surely Abraham being gathered to his people is not a reference to the tomb that his body was placed in. Which leads me to conclude then that in this short statement, we have a hint as to what happens to people upon death. Now this is the part of the sermon where I feel like my notes get a little bit uh, whack, but bear with me for a few minutes and just think about this, or at least try to consider. Although some philosophers would deny this, I think most people would agree that human nature is a dichotomy. Body and soul. Material and immaterial. And it is the soul that animates the physical. It's because of the soul that we have rationality, morality, freedom of thought, things like these. Unless you are a staunch atheist and you reject the possibility of God or anything spiritual or supernatural, then you have to deny the reality of a soul, but then you would be forced to conclude with the popular atheist Sam Harris that free will itself is a delusion. And if that's the case, then you have to say that our, our very thoughts then are nothing more than just chemical reactions going off in the brain, uh, reactions from which we really have no control and therefore we really don't have any freedom of thought. We have no rationality. Uh, there really is no morality. But I think any reasonable person knows intuitively that that's just not the case. A acknowledging that we are body and soul makes the most sense of reality itself. But if we do have an immaterial soul, then surely that soul isn't confined to time or space. It is immaterial, and therefore it's not subject to physical death, which leads me to conclude what most people already believe, that when a person dies, they still continue to exist in some way. That's why almost everybody at any given funeral will say such things as, well, so-and-so is now up above, and they're, they're looking down at us. If you've ever seen somebody post uh, the death of somebody on Facebook, you'll see a hundred comments there, and so many of those comments will be like, ah, oh, she's in heaven now. She's in a better place. He's there with the Lord. Even non-Christians say this all the time, and yet by those very claims, people demonstrate belief in the afterlife. They acknowledge a belief that Life goes on even after death in some way, that when, when people die, they continue to exist in some way. But if that's the case, what then really does happen to the soul after death? We think of going up to God when we die, but in the Old Testament, you don't see that language. Instead, people talked about going down, down into the underworld, into a place called Sheol, which in the Old Testament is a place or a realm in which the souls of the departed go upon death. So, for example, Genesis chapter 42, verse 8, Jacob warned his son, saying, you would bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to Sheol. First uh, Samuel chapter 2, verse 6, it says, the Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol, and raises up. Job chapter 7 verse 9, 9 that says, as the clouds fade and vanish, so he who goes down to Sheol does not come up. Isaiah 14 verse 9, Sheol beneath is stirred up to meet you when you come. Now do I believe that there is this an actual place called Sheol, that it really does exist? Yes, I do. But do I believe that if you start digging with a shovel that you're going to come to this place where there's dead souls somewhere in the earth? I don't think that. I think what people were doing is they were using spatial language to describe what happened upon death. Uh, if God is transcendent and he dwells in the heavens above, and if death is a step away from the presence of God, then where do you go except downward, away from God? See, the language it depicts movement away from the divine presence. 
Now, supposedly, during the time in history between the Old and New Testaments, Jews became very fascinated with the afterlife and came to believe that Sheol itself had multiple compartments within it. A compartment for the righteous people who died, where their souls would rest in peace, and another compartment of torment for wicked people. The compartment of the righteous within Sheol was sometimes called Abraham's bosom, if you've ever heard of that, and sometimes called paradise, an alternate term for it, both of which Jesus used. The other compartment was known as Hades, and it was separated from Abraham's bosom by a great chasm. Jesus himself made reference to these places in Luke chapter 16, 19 through 31, uh, and he calls them by their very name, but he doesn't offer any explanation of these places, which suggests that these places were well known and believed by the Jews of his day. And Jesus himself doesn't give any indication uh, that these places were mythological. You listen to the words of Jesus, and it seems like he took them as really being true. Sheol is a real place where the dead go. And yet there does seem to be uh, a discrepancy, it seems like it, between the Old and the New Testament. Uh, Early Christians started talking about going up upon death, going to be with Christ. Like Paul says, I'd rather depart and be with Christ. In fact, Hebrews 11, this is kind of an interesting one to me, it talks about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, other Old Testament saints, and how they all died in faith. Uh, Hebrews 11 is that, you know, it's called like the Hall of Faith chapter. But then in Hebrews chapter 12, the author of Hebrews goes on to say that we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, suggesting that the Old Testament saints are, they're up, not down. A cloud, it signifies being above. And that then does raise a seeming contradiction in my mind. How can these Old Testament saints talk about going down upon death and then in the New Testament said to be up in the clouds, up with Christ? Well, what is it? Are they down or are they up? It's food for thought. Either way, we circle back to Abraham, and by his life, we are reminded of what a life well lived uh, looks like in the eyes of God, but in his death, we're reminded of why our life and what we choose to do with it is so incredibly important, and that's because eternity really is at stake. That's why eternity really is at stake and we're reminded of it when we see Abraham quote unquote being gathered to his people. Okay, now let's consider a few things about the descendants of Abraham. So we've seen his life, we've seen his death. Uh, Consider just briefly some of his descendants. Uh, It's been believed from ancient times that these sons and grandsons uh, we'd become many of the Arab nations that are still around today. And that does appear to be the case. Uh, a, few, a few descendants would be pointed out in particular that I just find, I find this interesting, so I'll, I'll share it. If you don't find it interesting, feel free to flush it down the toilet. Um, Shua in verse 2, or we see Shua in verse 2. Um, one of Abraham's son sons is Shua in verse 2, and one grandson is Tema or Tema. Some of these names, to be honest with you, I'm not sure how to pronounce them, so please give me grace in my terrible readings of this text. And these two sons appear to be the ancestors of Job's infamous friends, Eliphaz and Bildad in the book of Job. It's kind of interesting here, and I have connections even to Job. It's been believed, um, or another noteworthy name is Sheba or Sheba. We see that one in there. Later on in 1 Kings chapter 10, we see that there's a kingdom named Sheba, in the, and the queen of that kingdom came to visit Solomon during his reign. Scholars aren't 100% sh- are certain where this kingdom was, but the consensus is that Sheba was on the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula, and that it expanded into the Horn of Africa. And this actually makes a lot of sense to me, because 
um, Sheba, the descendant of Abraham, was sent eastward to the east country. But Jesus, in the Gospels, called the Queen of Sheba the Queen of the South, which suggests that Sheba itself was east of Israel and south. Well, where does that put you? It puts you in the Arabian Peninsula. (coughs) The last name to consider is Ephr in verse 4. Ephr in Hebrew means dust or dirt, and the consonants of it in Hebrew sound like A-F-R, Ephr. Have you ever wondered where the name Africa comes from? Scholars, historians, they don't know. There's a number of theories, but nobody's certain where it comes from. However, Josephus, who was a first century historian, lived right after the time of Christ, a very reliable source of Jewish history. He writes extensively on Jewish history. And according to Josephus, uh, the sons and grandsons of Abraham took possession of East Africa, and later on they named it Africa after their grandfather, Ephor. Which, again, can that be proven true? No. It seems very plausible to me, and if that's the case, it's like, huh, the entire continent is named here after the grandson of Abraham. I don't know. I just found that very interesting. (coughs) The last thing to consider here is uh, verse 18. This is where I really want to kind of land the plane on. Verse 18 is talking about the descendants of Ishmael, and it says that they settled from Havilah to Shur, which is opposite Egypt in the direction of Assyria. Uh, He settled over against all his kinsmen. What this indicates is that Ishmael's descendants, uh, they ended up primarily to the south and to the east of Israel. Uh, If you look on a map, if you look up Havilah and Shur, it would suggest that the descendants of Ishmael also kind of ended up where the other sons of Abraham ended up, to the east, to the south, all over the Arabian Peninsula and other Middle Eastern countries. And so you have this kind of this general movement eastward from Abraham. Now keep that in mind, and I would invite you to turn to Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60. In the earlier chapters of Isaiah, it was prophesied that the Jews, uh, would, they would be conquered by their enemies, they would lose everything, the city of Jerusalem would basically be uh, leveled to the ground, and the people would go into exile. There's some really dark chapters in Isaiah, but Isaiah chapter 60 is this wonderful, glorious prophecy that sometime in the future, the people of God, the city of God, the temple of God, it would all be restored, and it would become far more glorious than ever before. Now, before you look at Isaiah 60, notice Isaiah chapter 59, verse 20, right there at the end of the previous chapter. It says in verse 20, A redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who turn from transgressions, declares the Lord. So a note about the word Zion. It was the name of the city of Jerusalem before King David conquered it. We see this in 2 Samuel chapter 5. So Zion in scripture often refers to Jerusalem. It's an alternate, alternative term for the city, but other times it refers to the temple mount in Jerusalem, which was considered to be the dwelling place of God. So sometimes the city itself, sometimes the temple within the city, and In the prophets, Zion seems to take on more of a a heavenly sense. It's a term that really seems to emphasize the people of God, those who worship God, who praise him, who call upon his name. That then leads us to chapter 60, verse 1, which is a prophecy about the future of Zion. And in this chapter, all all the meanings of Zion seem to be at play here. So look at Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1. It says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Talking about Zion. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light, 
and kings to the brightness of your rising. So these verses poetically explain how even though the whole world is covered in darkness, there is a day coming where Zion alone is going to have light. Why? Because the Lord himself is going to rise upon this place. The glory of God is going to be revealed here. Now, Isaiah chapter 60, verse 4, it goes on to say, Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together, they come to you. Your sons shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be carried on a hip. So these verses here indicate that even Jews living far away would come back to this city, the city of Zion. They'd be filled with joy. The passage goes on to say in verse 5, Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and exult. Because of the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba, shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall bring good news, the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered to you. The rams of Nebaioth shall minister to you. They shall come up with acceptance on my altar, and, the, and I will beautify my beautiful house. These verses here, as well as the rest of the chapter, give the picture that not only will Jews return to this glorious city, but other nations are going to be attracted to it and come flocking in. So the chapter seems to be depicting, again, what we might call this heavenly city, this this place called Zion, in which Jews and Gentiles dwell together in the light of the glory of God. But notice how these nations are said to bring gold and frankincense into the city. And verse 7 says that they would even come to the altar which means that these nations are going to come to the very temple of God where God himself dwells, and they're going to be accepted there. And yet, here's the kicker to all this. Did you notice the names of the nations, at least some of the nations mentioned here, coming into Zion in Isaiah chapter 60? Midian, Sheba, Nebaioth, Kedar, if they sound familiar, it's because these, these names, they come right from Genesis chapter 25. These nations that are descended from Abraham, these people who Abraham, you remember, he sent them eastward, to the east country. Isaiah chapter 60 is prophesying this day where nations are going to come back from the east to the city of God. They're going to come into Israel. They're going to come to Zion. And they're going to worship God. Why is this important? Because in Genesis chapter 25, it doesn't really seem like God cares about these other sons of Abraham, does it? They just go away. And so they get sent away into these far off lands. And yet back in Genesis chapter 12, God promised to bless every nation through Abraham. And we learn from Isaiah chapter 60 that even these nations would be invited to participate in that blessing. They weren't forgotten at all. It's a reminder to us that God cares about every nation, every people, every family on earth. God cares deeply about, and if that's the case, should we not too? But there's something else to be said about all this, which is the fulfillment of this passage. Uh, When exactly is Isaiah chapter 60 fulfilled? Interestingly enough, uh, some of the language of Isaiah chapter 60 is found in Revelation chapter 21, almost verbatim, suggesting that the ultimate fulfillment doesn't really happen until the, the end of time, when God ushers in a new heavens and a new earth. And yet, there are many clues that lead me to think that Isaiah chapter 60 and all these wonderful promises begin to be fulfilled much earlier. We might say partially fulfilled. Isaiah chapter 60, it talks about the light of God one day shining upon Zion. Yet at the time that Jesus of Nazareth was born, 
all the gospel writers and people within the gospels talk about the light of God coming into the world. To give just one example, a righteous old man named Simon, he holds the young Jesus in his lap. He sees Jesus for the first time. And in Luke chapter 2, verse 29, this Simon says, and he's filled with the Spirit in this moment, he says, Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all people a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Notice how Simon here is using language that sounds strikingly similar to Isaiah chapter 60. The light of God is coming to his people. There's a light being given for all the nations. We could go on and look at Zechariah in Luke chapter 1 and what he says in his prophecy related to John. Uh, the gospel of John chapter 1, the true light was coming into the world. That's how he introduces Jesus. But then over in Matthew's gospel in chapter 2, we, we have this famous story, we probably all know of it, where after the birth of Jesus, wise men or magi, they come into Jerusalem from the east which is very striking because, as we already saw, if the descendants of Abraham came to Israel, they would have to have come from the east. Even more interesting is the fact that these wise men brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, two of which are explicitly mentioned in Isaiah chapter 60. Are all these, these details, these parallel details between Isaiah 60 and the Gospels a mere coincidence? No, I don't think so at all. The gospel writers are showing us that the distant promises of Isaiah chapter 60 are now becoming a reality. But what's odd about these wise men, going back to the story, is that they don't bring their gifts to Jerusalem or to the Jerusalem temple that was there, which is what we would have expected from the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 60. Because remember how Isaiah chapter 60 talks about the nations bringing their gifts to the altar? So we would expect these wise men coming in to Jerusalem to, to lay their gifts at the altar of Herod's temple in Jerusalem, but they don't. Instead, the wise men go south of Jerusalem to a small town called Bethlehem, and they lay their gifts at the feet of this small child named Jesus. Why? Because they realized that the true temple in which the fullness of God dwells was right here in front of them. They didn't just come to Jesus, but they came to Emmanuel, which rightly means God with us. They were looking for the true city of God, and they knew it could be found only in Christ Christ is the Son of God who came into the world not simply to teach us a better way of life, but he came to save us from sin and to unite us to, to, unite us to the true and living God. He accomplished this salvation through the cross where he gave his life to redeem us from sin and death. So it is then that Christ is the only gate through which the world can enter into the presence of God. And we enter into it by faith. Surely this is why the author of Hebrews wrote to Christians saying, You have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the innumerable, innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. But what happened to Jesus after he died? This is the question I want to wrestle with briefly before we close our time. What happened to Jesus between his death and his resurrection? The Apostles' Creed, which is one of the earliest summaries of the Christian faith, and it's still widely accepted in many Christian circles today, has a line in there that Christ descended into hell. And yet that particular statement is usually ignored 
or flat out rejected by many Christians today. And so we tend to either just sweep it under the rug uh, or just, yeah, not do anything with it. But I want to close by offering a quick defense of why I think Christ really did descend into hell as said in the Apostles' Creed. First of all, when the creed speaks of hell, it doesn't mean hell in the sense that we think of it, like this, this lake of fire. It was referring to the realm of the dead as seen in the Old Testament. Uh, Sheol, which I've already talked about. People claim that there's no biblical evidence for Christ descending into Sheol. I think there is, though. What I really think is the case is that some interpreters reject the idea altogether, and then they interpret certain passages in uh, a different way, a way that doesn't seem to make full sense to me, and then from their interpretation, which I find faulty in the first place, then they say, well, there's no biblical evidence for it. That seems to be the problem for me, but be that as it may, I do think there is plenty of biblical evidence for it. Ephesians chapter 4, 7, for example, says, grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey. Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, Jesus says, For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. When Jesus talked about being in the heart of the earth, it doesn't really seem like he was talking about being in a rock-cut tomb. Furthermore, when you think about Jonah's lament in Jonah chapter 2, Jonah felt like he was in Sheol. Psalm chapter 30, verse 3 David, he says, O Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Psalm chapter 86, verse 13, David says again, For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. Was David talking about himself? I don't think so. He was speaking prophetically of Christ the true and the greater David. When Christ died, he experienced the full weight of death, and that meant descending even into the place of the dead. And yet the very death of Christ became the saving grace of the Old Testament saints because there for the first time, they saw with their own eyes the salvation of God. There in that moment, their faith was vindicated and yet Acts chapter 2, verse 24, it says that God raised Christ up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Christ was resurrected from the dead on the third day and ascended into heaven where he now sits at the right hand of God. And when he ascended, he brought with him those who were held captive by the power of death. That's why the Old Testament saints who went down to Sheol are now said to be among the cloud of witnesses. Why the change? Why that seeming discrepancy from the Old Testament to the New Testament? It's because of the resurrection of Christ. Only there, in that sense, can you make sense of all of it. It may be an odd belief. I know you probably, if you're like me, you've never even heard this preached from a sermon. But to me, it just makes the passion of Christ even more beautiful, even more profound, and it reminds us of why not even death itself is to be feared. Christ defeated it. As the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 8, not even death can separate us from the love of God. We know that to be true because Christ defeated death. Amen. Hey, let me close this with a word of prayer. And as we do, I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward. Our gracious Heavenly Father, um, thank you for your word so fascinating and yet lord we know it's true just pray father that 
as we're reminded today that all your promises do come to pass. They will come to pass. Your word will not return void. I pray then that we would cling to it as if our eternal fate hangs on it, because it does. Lord, if we hear your voice today, let us not harden our hearts. Father, if there is anybody in here who is giving you the stiff arm, Lord, I just pray that you would soften their hearts. They would see the power of God, the salvation that you've given us in Jesus Christ, the love that you have for us. Lord, our heart is restless until it rests in you. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Be an intellectual.